morning. Thank you for the privilege of worshiping with you this morning and especially the privilege of being able to bring God's word to you. Please turn with me, if you will, in your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 2. In the bulletin it says that uh, only two verses, chapter 3, 1, and 2, and we will read those last, but first we'll read the entirety of 2 Peter chapter 2. So beginning with 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you, who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of truth will be maligned. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their judgment from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to the pits of darkness reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. And if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having made them an example to those who would live ungodly lives thereafter, and if he rescued righteous Lot, oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men, for by what he saw and heard that righteous man while living among them felt his righteous soul tormented day after day by their lawless deeds, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge the flesh in its corrupt desires and despise authority. Daring, self-willed, they do not tremble when they revile angelic majesties. Whereas angels, who are greater in might and power, do not bring a reviling judgment against them before the Lord. But these, like unreasoning animals, born as creatures of instinct to be captured and killed, reviling where they have no knowledge, will in the destruction of those creatures also be destroyed. Suffering wrong as the wages of doing wrong. They count it a pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are stains and blemishes reveling in their deceptions as they carouse with you, having eyes full of adultery that never cease from sin, enticing unstable souls, having a heart trained in greed, accursed children. Forsaking the right way, they have gone astray, having followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. But he received a rebuke for his own transgression. For a mute donkey speaking with the voice of a man restrained the madness of the prophet. These are springs without water and mists driven by a storm, for whom the black darkness has been reserved. For speaking out arrogant words of vanity, they entice by fleshly desires, by sensuality, those who barely escape from the ones who live in error, promising them freedom while they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by what a man is overcome by this, he is enslaved. For if, after they have escaped the defilements of the world, by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, are overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would, have, it would be better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn away from the holy commandment handed on to them. It happened to them, according to the true proverb, a dog returns to its own vomit, and a sow after washing returns to wallowing in the mire. This is now, beloved, the second letter I am writing to you, in which I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of a reminder that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets 
and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. Our passage today begins with a sobering reminder of our Lord's prediction, a prediction for the period of time following his resurrection and ascension into heaven. That prediction is, there will also be false teachers among you. According to the Gospels, the Lord himself predicted the rise of just such deceivers in the church who would bring a false message and seek to lead us astray. In Matthew 24 and also in Mark 13, we read that Jesus predicted just as follows to his apostles. Quote, false Christs and false prophets will arise in order, if possible, to lead the elect astray. In making this prediction, the Lord was not talking merely about a brief period of time at the very end of the world, as some today might say. He was also not talking simply about the days of the apostles. Rather, the Lord Jesus was speaking about the primary danger which is and was to be present in the church from the time of the apostles even to the, ends, the end of the earth, the time when the Lord Jesus himself would return. In short, in writing this warning, which Peter here echoes in this letter, we are receiving a warning ourselves. It is a warning to us. 1,500 years earlier, God, through Moses, described very similar deceivers and warned against them in two places within the law. We read in the law, the prophet who shall speak a word presumptuously in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or which he shall speak in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. The apostle, put, the apostle Paul puts it this way, excuse me. The law continues, if a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder comes true, which he spoke to you, saying, let us go after other gods whom you have not known, and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to find out if you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall, not fo you shall follow the Lord your God and fear him. You shall keep his commandments, listen to his voice, serve him and cling to him. But that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has counseled rebellion against the Lord your God who brought you from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery to seduce you from the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk. You shall purge the evil from among you. Taken from Deuteronomy 13 and Deuteronomy 18. According to the Gospels, Jesus warned his apostles that the false prophets about whom Moses had warned Israel long ago, those false prophets that had vexed Israel down through the days of history, of the history of Israel, particularly poignant in the days of Jeremiah, those false prophets will have their New Testament counterparts in our era, in this present age. Thus it appears that Peter is following the Lord's teaching when in today's passage, he compares the false teachers of our era to those false prophets of old. Again, please look with me at chapter 2, verse 1. False prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you, who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. It is the very nature of the age in which we live that false teachers, deviant gospel preachers, must arise within the church, right alongside of those who are true and who are faithful. It happened in the days of Peter and Paul, and it happens today, just as the Lord 
and his apostles predicted. The Apostle Paul, similarly, puts it this way in Philippians chapter 3. For many live as enemies of the cross of Christ, as I have often told you of them, and now I tell you even with tears. For Paul, the warning had been repeated to the point of becoming a maxim. Many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. If anyone thinks that his church is immune from such dangers, he is wrong, potentially dead wrong. The nature of our present age is that the devil uses Christians, false Christians, to seduce us. As Jesus puts it, if possible, to lead even the elect astray. If we think to ourselves, we're above such temptations, we're only fooling ourselves. After all, our OPC founding fathers, faithful though they were, whether you think back all the way to Calvin or to Machen, John Murray, Cornelius Van Til, our fathers in the faith are certainly no better teachers than the Apostle Paul. Please recall what happened to a church that Paul had founded very shortly after he left. Apparently, just after Paul founded the church, and Paul had preached the gospel, he describes his original gospel preaching to them as such, before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. He's not talking about an overhead projector. He's talking about his preaching, vividly preaching Christ and him crucified. Yet Paul begins that letter to the Galatians with these words. I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the gospel of Christ for a different gospel. False teaching takes many forms today. The most obvious are certainly the cults, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, Moonies, and many others. They have their own literature, the Book of Mormon, the Watchtower publications the writings of Sun Myung Moon. These false teachers instruct their members, the members of their sects, in such a way that they always read the Bible through the eyes of their teachers, through the interpretations that have been published by their leaders. But such false teaching is not only in the cults. Even churches which profess to be Christian may be affected. The so-called mainline churches of all stripes have for more than 100 years been infected to various degrees with false teaching, which in various ways denies the authority and the inspiration of Scripture. Gresham Machen's famous book, Christianity and Liberalism, rightly argued that just like the Galatian heresy, which affected the churches in Paul's day, liberalism that has now destroyed most of the mainline denominations and has infected others in more subtle, insidious ways is in fact a different religion. A different religion with a different gospel. The liberalistic approach to scripture, like the cults, means that one cannot simply read his Bible and take it at face value. Special interpretive tools, special approaches developed and utilized by the so-called experts must be used if we are to understand scripture aright, they will tell you. Whether in the cults or in mainline liberalism, false teachers insist on supplementing the plain teaching of scripture with human wisdom, which is ultimately satanic wisdom. Teaching similar to that which Machen faced continues to threaten the American church and the Japanese church as well, including even the Reformed Church in Japan with which we work. Flirting with modernism leaves the church open to all sorts of false teaching. 
feminism, which has infected the Japanese society, even it has, a, as a, it has our own, threatens the church in Japan today. It is at risk, though it has not yet officially embraced such teaching. The Japanese church needs our prayers and more. What then are we to do? How are we to be protected by such false teachers? Thankfully, the Apostle Peter wrote this entire second letter in order to help a church in his day to deal with just such false teaching. And the church at large to be able to continue to deal with such false teaching even after the Apostle Peter himself was called into the presence of his Savior. Today, I would like to focus on two crucial remedies that the Apostle Peter provides in this letter against this pernicious threat to, the, to his church and ours. In 2 Peter chapter 1, we read that, as he wrote, Peter was about to die. Peter uses the Greek word, which sounds like our word exodus. It means departure but he uses it to describe his impending death. The King James reasonably interprets it as death when it, when it reads as follows in 2 Peter 1, 14 and 15. Knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. These things, always in remembrance. Unusually, but not uniquely, these things, the term these things, a single word in Greek, in this context, look forward, not backward, for their definition. These things are the things which comprise the gospel story which Peter had told his readers, this church to which he wrote, over and over again. As the next verse says, when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. As Peter wrote this final letter, a sort of last will and testament, he was not only in prison facing his imminent martyrdom, but he was making preparations for his exodus, for his departure. Translated woodenly, he was getting ready from his exodus from the church on earth to the church in heaven. Peter was endeavoring, he was making preparations so that we, so that his readers would be able after his exodus to keep that gospel story in remembrance, that story which he had told his readers over and over. The early church fathers beginning a little over 30 years later after Peter wrote this letter, inform us that Peter accomplished this task as he successfully made such preparations for his departure by having Mark, who seems to have been his interpreter in his last days in Rome, prepare the New Testament document, which we call the Gospel according to Mark. Now, why is this so important? Peter was about to die, and he knew it. The Lord had revealed it to him. And it was crucial for the church after him that she should have his official eyewitness account of the life, teaching, works, death, and resurrection of Christ. That is, his account of the power and coming of our Lord in a permanent, imperishable form lest the false teachers of that generation or of those generations to come take away from that account, add to it, twist it, as those false teachers always do. The apostles are the foundation of the church in the sense, particularly in the sense, that their gospel accounts comprise the only reliable knowledge that we have about the Lord Jesus about his life, teaching, death, and resurrection. Thus, Peter's first provision in order to deal with these false teachers was to provide the church with his witness to Jesus in written form. Mark, 
is Peter's chief contribution to the church's New Testament. It's not accidental. It's not an afterthought. It's not something that Mark on his own came up with. Mark and the other Gospels are the apostles' greatest heritage bequeathed to the church for the ages to come. In today's passage, however, Peter makes another crucial contribution to protecting the church against those false teachers. In chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, Peter tells us that this is the second time that he is writing a letter to this particular church. He also tells us that both letters, both epistles, had the same purpose. Like his earlier letter to them, the point of this letter is singular. It has one central purpose. According to the New American Standard translation, which we just read, he is writing, quote, so that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. Or the ESV for this last phrase is probably a bit more accurate. The word spoken is not actually there. Through your apostles. The commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. Despite appearances in English translations, verse 2 is not describing two different purposes. Peter is not urging them, first of all, to remember the words of the holy prophets of the Old Testament, and then second, the commandment of the Lord Jesus through the apostles, as if these two signify different things. Rather, these two things, the words of the holy prophets of old and the commandment of the Lord through the apostles are ultimately one and the same. The commandment of the Lord and Savior, which is in view, was foreseen by the prophets of old, and yet it was actually delivered to the church by the Lord Jesus through the apostles. This commandment is identical to the the holy commandment, which is mentioned earlier in chapter 2, verse 21, where Peter writes concerning the false teachers, it would be better for them to not have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn away from the holy commandment delivered to them. Peter tells us that the false teachers had turned away from the holy commandment returning like dogs to their own vomit. That commandment pertains to the teacher's teaching. It was delivered to them. It was imposed upon them as duty when they took up their office of teaching. To be protected from these false teachers of this present era, it is absolutely crucial that the church have true teachers who not only possess and teach the true gospels, and the other apostolic writings of the New Testament, but also that those teachers keep that great commandment of the Lord Jesus, which he delivered to the church and to the teachers for generations to come through the apostles just before he ascended into heaven. That commandment was imposed through the apostles on the teachers, much like when we are ordained and installs as teachers or preachers in the church. It reads as follows, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. It is the Lord's commandment to make even the pagan nations disciples for the Lord. According to Jesus, in the passage which, in God's providence, was read for us earlier in Luke 24, we read that according to the Lord Jesus, it was predicted ahead of time in the Old Testament. When in Luke 24, Jesus opened the apostles' minds to understand the Old Testament scriptures, he declared that those scriptures predicted not only the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, but also 
He said that those scriptures of the Old Testament, the prophets of old, also predicted the proclamation of the gospel to the nations. Once again, Luke 24, verse 45. Jesus opened their minds to understand the scriptures, i.e. the Old Testament. He said to them, thus it is written, that the Christ should suffer and rise again from the dead on the third day, and it is written that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. The message of the Old Testament includes the Great Commission. In passages such as Isaiah 2 and Micah 4, the Old Testament's the Old Testament prophets foresaw and predicted the discipling of the nations to know and worship the true God as disciples of the Lord. Turn with me, if you will, to Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2. Isaiah 2, verse 2, Now it will come about in the last days. The mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains and will be raised above the hills, and all the nations will stream to it. And many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways and that we may walk in his paths the discipling of the nations. For the law will go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, and he will judge between the nations and will render decisions for many peoples. Whether in Japan, in North America, in Europe, Africa, or South America, truly and faithfully making the nations into disciples of Jesus, by baptizing them and by teaching them to observe all that he has commanded in the Old and in the New Testaments is the only way to build the kingdom of God and it is the only way to protect the church against the false teachers. Those false teachers which are the principal threat to the church in this age. Furthermore, Please note the same language which is used by the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 6. There again, Paul is seeking to help Timothy to counter the false teachers who are at work in Ephesus. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 12 and 13. Here too, an apostle, this time Paul, refers to Jesus' commandment simply as the commandment just as we read in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 2. The Apostle Paul writes, I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who testified the good confession before Pontius Pilate that you keep the commandment without stain or reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. The commandment of the Lord and Savior, the commandment through your apostles, delivered to the church through the apostles, was so central in the life of the apostolic churches, as your pastor has reminded you earlier in this worship service, that the churches simply called it the commandment. It was the commandment above all others. This commandment must be the goal and the main focus of your prayers, of your offerings, of your life as a church. And so Peter urges us also, I am writing to stir up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. Let us as a church not only remember it, but pursue it vigorously and with sincerity, lest the false teachers attack us as well. Let us pray.